Thank you. What a warm welcome. Thanks, everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm excited. I've been looking forward to this for a while. Yeah. yeah I'm really glad that you could make it, yeah. make it out. So I was wondering, for those, of, for those here who don't really know about your background, where you're from, can you talk a little bit about where you grew up sure. uh, and maybe tell us a little bit about your family and even your religious background? Uh, I was born in Iran. Uh, I am an immigrant. Uh, I'm here to steal all your jobs, uh, all, all, the, all the religion jobs that you won't do. <laughs> um, uh, my family came, I, you know, we were sort of a, you know, culturally Muslim family, the way so many people are culturally religious. My father, however, um, was a uh, kind of a firebrand communist, very anti-religious. Uh, um, proud atheist, annoying atheist, um, <laughs> the kind of atheist who always had a pocket full of Prophet Muhammad jokes that he would pull out at inappropriate times, you know, like that yeah. kind of atheist. Um, and uh, I, actually, it was kind of fortunate for us because when the revolution happened in Iran in 1979, uh, Iran had a, a massive popular revolution to bring down um, the, uh, the monarchy. and. Um, when the Ayatollah Khomeini came back to Iran and, and said that you know, he, he had no interest in any kind of political role for himself, he just wanted to be left alone, my father, who never trusted anyone wearing a turban, uh, thought, you know, I, just, just to be on the safe side, let's leave until things settle down a little bit. Um, and uh, turned out to be right. I mean, um, Khomeini ended up taking over the, the country and it became the Islamic Republic that it is now. And, uh, and I grew up mostly in the Bay Area um, of California. Uh, this was the 1980s, so it was during the, the height of the Iran hostage crisis. Mm -hmm. It was not the best time in the world to be uh, Iranian or Muslim. Did you, de did you deal with any prejudice as a result? Oh yeah, of that? it was uh, all the time. There were, there were protests out on our streets. My uh, uh, the bank wouldn't cash my father's uh, paychecks because he was Iranian. Uh, I would go to school and, and kids were wearing Bomb Iran t-shirts. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, I mean, you know, it, like I say, it, was, it wasn't the best time to be, to be Muslim, as opposed to now, when it's great. But back then, <laughs> back then it, wasn't, it, wasn't so, it wasn't so good. For like a seven-year-old kid, that's the thing, is that you know, when, you're, when you're seven years old, eight years old, and, and you're constantly being told that your identity, your culture, your religion is, is the enemy, um, you agree. And for us, when we came to the States, this was kind of, at least for my father, an opportunity to scrub our lives of Islam altogether. Um, mm -hmm. you know, he, never, he, he, he was so tired of pretending to be Muslim in Iran anyway, and he thought, well, one good thing is now we don't have to pretend anymore. Um, and so I grew up in a very sort of non-religious family. My mom still prayed every once in a while, but for the most part, um, you know, we, we really scrubbed our lives of Islam. As I've admitted many times, I, I spent a good part of the 1980s pretending to be Mexican. I just told everybody, <laughs> which tells you how little I understood America. <laughs> right. you know, it did not help at all. Um, and then, you know, I think it was probably I sometimes think that it may have been the effects of the of revolutionary Iran, the the uh, experience of seeing that the power that religion has to transform a society for good and for bad, um, which just created this lifelong interest in me, um, uh, an interest in religion and in religious history, religious figures, religious phenomenology, spirituality. Though, as I say, I never really had an opportunity to express that in any meaningful way until high school. Mm -hmm. uh, in high school, I started going to Young Life. <laughs> young Life? Young Life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Young Life in the back. <laughs> Represent. Um, uh, young Life, uh, for those of you unfamiliar with it, it's, it's a non-denominational, but non-denominational is now a denomination. So right. it's basically a, you know, a, a Protestant evangelical uh, youth group, and uh, I went to a Young Life camp, and I heard the gospel story for the first time. This incredible story about the God of heaven and earth coming down in the form of a baby, and dying for our sins. This, the promise that anyone who believes in Him um, shall also never die, but have eternal life. I had never heard 
anything like that before in my life. So with your dad being an atheist, did you all talk about afterlife at all? Or was that no. even a thing? That no, a we, thing? Did, we didn't talk about it. In fact, after I converted to Christianity, and a, and a particularly conservative evangelical brand of Christianity, um, my dad freaked out. He was just like, you know, why we came here to, to escape religion. This is the last thing that I wanted, but... Um, but you know, I mean, it, it made me a really good boy. Like I would come home and like I wouldn't drink and I did everything. So it was like, maybe this, this will work, <laughs> this is fine. I can like take advantage of, of this. Um, but I did have a problem. I mean, I, you know, I, I've never been the kind of person to just um, take what people tell me at face value. And so I would um, go to church or I would go to, you know, Bible study and, and um, I would hear the, the, the leader or the pastor say something or tell me something that the Bible says. And then I would check. <laughs> I would do that thing that we rarely do. Like, I'm just going to see, make sure that that's actually what it says. And you know what I, what I kept discovering is that, well, sometimes it doesn't say that, or sometimes there's context behind it. Um, and then I would bring these questions to, to my group. Uh, assuming that it would spur conversation. It did not spur conversation, <laughs> uh, <laughs> on the contrary. Um, but it just, it made me really interested and excited about um, the, the study of religion. And so when I went to college, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. And so I, I, I started studying religion in a more formal um, setting. More specifically, I started studying the New Testament. Um, and it didn't take long for me to kind of realize that a lot of what I thought I knew was incomplete, uh, if not just downright incorrect. And, uh, and then also the other thing too is I started learning about um, religion in general, right? Not just a religion, but what religion is, how religion functions, how to, how to think about religion in its historical aspect. And, um, and how to understand it as, as you know, fundamentally a language, a, a, a means through which uh, a, an individual in a community can uh, express what is fundamentally inexpressible, right? This, mm. this ineffable experience of the divine. Um, and the more I started studying about it, the more I realized that the particular language that I had adopted, the language of Protestant evangelical Christianity, uh, wasn't doing it for me, and that I needed a new language. And then, in one of these crazy sort of you know twists of fate, I went to a, a, a Catholic Jesuit college, um, and the priests there. If you know Jesuits, this makes a lot of sense to you. The priests there were like, "Why not go back to Islam?" Yeah. <laughs> I was like, "Okay, Father." Um, and, no, but it, that that really was. They they encouraged me. They said, "Look, you're clearly." You're clearly still searching for something here. Why not? Why not look at the, the faith of your forefathers? And I didn't know anything about Islam. I literally knew nothing about Islam at that point. And so I started reading up on it and and um, studying it. And the best way that I can put it, I don't know if this will make sense, but what I discovered was, it, it was what I already believed. I just didn't mm -hmm. know that there was a language for it. <laughs> and. So I often say that I had a, a, an emotional conversion to Christianity, and then I had an intellectual conversion to Islam. Ah. And here I am now. And here you are now. <laughs> Were you always, I mean, you're speaking of languages. I mean, it's clear to me from reading your books that you have a real grasp of the original languages in which these sacred s scriptures were written. Was that something that came easy to you, or was that something you had to really work out? No, I'm time? terrible at languages. <laughs> and it's terrible, because the study of religion is all about primary languages. Uh, and I'm really awful at it. My <laughs> wife is amazing. She can just pick up a language like that. Um, and I cannot. It, it was a real struggle for me. But I'm so glad you brought that up, because you know, in academia, we talk about it a lot, the importance of, of understanding, you know, primary languages, to, of, of reading, for instance, the New Testament, uh, not in English, but in Greek. Uh, and and it's, it is extraordinarily important, because what we have to understand is that the minute you translate something, you are interpreting it, especially when you talk about these 
languages like Greek or Hebrew or Arabic, which are so variable, um, where words have so many different meanings, denotations and connotations. And so somebody who translates it into English has already decided for you what that word means. Um, and it profoundly affects the way that you read and interpret the scripture. And if you are you know, somebody who is pious and devout and who truly believes that this is God-breathed scripture, um, then you should figure out how to get to its source uh, if you really want to understand it. Yeah, primary languages are, are extraordinarily important. Well, I have a quote I want to go from uh, No God But God, so I'm going to read this quote. It'll be up on the screens for you all to read because I like this quote. This is, um, this is what he says. Religion has always been more than a matter of beliefs and practices. It is, above all, a perspective, a mode of being. Religion encompasses one's culture, one's politics, one's very view of the world. This is particularly true of Islam, which, like all great religions, has been shaped not only by metaphysical concerns, but also by the social, cultural, spiritual, and political milieu in which it finds itself. And so I was wondering, since we're going to get into Islamic Reformation, can you expand on how that quote in particular can give us some insight into how Islam has been shaped by those forces over the last century? Yeah, thank you for that. It's, it's funny. Um, this is, I think, one of the, the more uh, counterintuitive things that I talk about a lot, that religion is far more a matter of identity than it is a matter of beliefs and practices. That of course beliefs and practices are important, um, but they are secondary to the identity statement that religion is. When someone raises their hand and says, I'm Muslim, I'm Christian, I'm Jewish, I'm Hindu, they are making an identity statement, not a belief statement. Um, the best way that I can sort of demonstrate this for you is by pointing to the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life, which says that 71% of Americans are Christian. 71%. <laughs> like really, really, seven out of 10 Americans, seven out of 10 Americans go to church on a regular basis, seven out of 10 Americans read the Bible, Seven out of 10 Americans can tell you anything about Jesus except that he was born in a manger and died on a cross. Right. Of course not. You know that that's not true. In your bones, you know that's not true. When that 70% says, I am Christian on that form, they're not saying, these are my beliefs. They're saying, this is my identity. This is who I am. And that's true everywhere in the world. When I said that we grew up Muslim, that's what I meant. I, know, like, I guess a, once in a while we went to mosque, but if you asked us, are we Muslim, we would say yes, because it's about who we are as human beings, how we understand ourselves, how we view how, our relationship to the world around us. And so as a matter of identity, going back to, to the quote, as a matter of identity, your religion is obviously wrapped up in all the other markers of your identity, be it your politics or your social status or your gender or your sexuality, whatever the case may be. Um, when you say, I am Christian, all of those things are wrapped up in it. Uh, your nationality, mm -hmm. your race, uh, your ethnicity, your culture. In fact, I would venture to guess that a great, great many of that 70%, when they mark, I am Christian, what they mean is, I am American. Mm. That's what they really mean. Um, and so I think that this creates some very important um, perspectives for thinking about not just Islam, but all religious traditions. For instance, I know that we talk a lot about getting religion out of politics, right? We hear that a lot, um, you know, that we should remove religion from politics. And, and I get that and I understand it. I also recognize that it's not actually possible because if religion is a matter of identity, then of course it's going to affect your politics. It should affect your politics. To say that you could just simply divorce your religion, which is who you are, not just your morals and your values, but who you are, from your 
uh, political role in life, uh, especially in a democracy, just doesn't make any sense. Does it cause bad things? Yes, a lot. <laughs> uh, no more or less than religion in general does. Um, the reason that I think that that, that quote was you know, seen as so re revelatory is because we tend to think of Islam as somehow different, mm. right? Everyone in this room would say, well, of course Christianity has changed throughout the centuries. Of course it's incredibly diverse. Of course a Christian in Guatemala has a different view of Jesus than a Christian in suburban Chicago does. Of course, like, it, that's obvious. Well, what about Islam? Oh, no, not Islam. No, 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 no. Islam is the same everywhere. <laughs> it's never changed. It's monolithic and static. You know, it's just, it's absurd the way that we think. Um, and it's important to understand that Islam, be, beyond just its cultural diversity, has an enormous uh, diversity of, of belief, a diversity of practice, a diversity of perspectives, and to the point where, in the same way that you couldn't say with a straight face, Christianity is blank, you can't say that with Islam either, that it, it is in a constant state of evolution. It's constantly adapting itself to the needs of every particular Muslim community around the world, um, and that it will continue to do so. Why do you think that we have a tendency towards monolithic interpretations of religions? And you know, you can you can go off on a lot of tangents yeah, with that, but um, but I'm interested to know why do you think as people we tend to do that? Well, because. Um, earlier I said religion is about identity. Religion is about collective identity. That's what it's really about. It's about us and them. It's about tribalism. It's about um, who is one of me and who is not. And I think that it fosters that kind of um, uh, sentiment in, in people, uh, an otherization, if you will. Um, you know, I was in Egypt uh, uh, many, many years ago, and I said something about um, uh, America to a cab driver or something, and he's like, so there, you know, America, it's a lot of Christians in America, huh? And I said, yes, a, a lot of Christians. And he said, what is the deal? Why do, why do, the, why do Americans worship the Pope? I don't, like, what, why, <laughs> what is that? And I was like, wow, there's so many layers. <laughs> there of wrongness. I don't know where to. I don't know where to begin. Uh, Egypt is a country in which 10% of the population is Christian and 90% of the population is Muslim. America is a country in which 70% of the of the country is Christian and 1% is Muslim. You could be born, live a very long, happy life, and die in America, and never, ever set eyes on a Muslim. There are 350 million of us, three and a half million of us are Muslim. So it, it's very obvious why one would think of Islam as a kind of other religion. You know, when confronted, for instance, with um, extreme versions of Christianity, um, extreme versions of Christianity that promote bigotry or, or violence or intolerance. It's very easy for Americans to say, well, that's not the Christianity I know. Whether you are a Christian or not, well, that's not, that's not normative Christianity. How do you know? Because my neighbor is Christian. <laughs> because my, my grocer is Christian. And so I know, I know that that's not representative of it. But if 1% of the population is Muslim, then you have nothing to compare it to. So when you see extreme forms of Islam, you can't say, well, that's not really Islam. How do you know? Well, I don't. I don't know any Muslims. So maybe it is. I don't know. Maybe it is. I have nothing to compare it to. I think that's, that's part of it. And then the other part of it is, again, this sort of uh, the tribalism that is so endemic to religion, right? Uh, the, the old adage that my religion is a religion and your religion is a cult. 
right? <laughs> that, that idea, that, that notion, like, you know? Yeah. Uh, my, my religion, you get this all the time when people are like, um, you know, there are, there are verses in the, in the Quran that, that uh, promote violence. And I'll say, yeah, but there are verses in the Bible that promote violence. Yeah, but those, we don't have to listen to those. <laughs> those don't really count. But yours do. Yours do count. You're different. See, right. yours is different. Yours is unique. Yours is not like the others. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty standard application that all people of religion apply to other religions. Hmm. So we're talking about a reformation that's happening right now. And so I think within this, and I want to make sure that I get your, your quote right on this here, um, you have defined religious reformations, regardless of what they are, whether they take place Judaism, Christianity, right. Islam. You've defined it as a struggle between institutions and individuals over religious authority. That's right. So explain to us how this struggle is taking place right now, currently within Islam. Paint a picture for us. Well, let me unpack that for a minute. Yeah, yeah. Because I think, especially in America, when we hear the word reformation, we have this sort of uh, skewed view of what that means, right? right. We, we think of it, because immediately we think of the, well, what we uh, erroneously refer to as the Protestant Reformation, right? right. Because in our, in our impression of it, the Reformation was really just this kind of battle between uh, Protestant reform and, and Catholic intransigence, and the Protestants won. <laughs> you know? Um, and it, that's such a weird and skewed way of thinking about, first of all, what happened in the Christian Reformation, but just what Reformation means in general. The Christian Reformation was about who has the authority to define Christianity. Mm -hmm. Is it the institution, the papal institution, which at that point had essentially maintained an absolute iron grip over the meaning and message of Christianity for a number of reasons. Most importantly, because they were the only ones with access to the scripture, that no one else could access the scripture. No one else literally could read the Bible. It was untranslated, it was unavailable, there was no printing press. Um, the only person that you would have ever met in your life who had any access, who even owned the Bible, was your priest. And so if your priest told you, the Bible says X, Y, and Z, well, that's what it says, because what do you, I mean, there's no, there's no checking him, right? Mm -hmm. And if the Pope says, I am the only one who can say what this religion is, and if you disagree with me, then you're just not in the group anymore, um, that authority structure, you can understand, can't last once information starts to be disseminated. Once scripture is available to uh, other people, once it's translated into German so that you can read it on your own now, now you don't have to read the Latin any longer. Um, at that point, then everyone suddenly becomes their own source of authority. And you don't have to necessarily rely on the institutional authority any longer. That conflict between individuals and institutions over who gets to define the faith resulted in what we now know the, uh, as the Christian Reformation, but that is a universal phenomenon. You brought up the Jewish uh, Reformation. Mm -hmm. This is what happened in the first century. It's funny because from the Christian perspective, Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, the living God on, on earth. From the Jewish perspective, Jesus is the Martin Luther you know, of Judaism in a way. Um, he is one of a handful of individuals who long before the destruction of the temple um, were promoting a text-based Judaism instead of a temple-based Judaism. Same thing. Judaism was in the grip of the temple priests, the priestly authorities who had sole discretion over who could and could not be a member of this uh, community. They had sole discretion over who could or could not enter the temple, and the temple was literally the sole source of God on earth. Um, yet there were a group of uh, radical, learned Jews whose argument was that the temple 
is not where Judaism rests. The scripture is where it rests. Now, they got a, a little bit of a boost because in the year 70, the temple was destroyed. And so there was no longer any temple. And after that point, the only Judaism that existed was rabbinical Judaism. Um, but again, what is, what is happening there? Institutions and individuals dis, dif, di, conflicting with themselves over who can define the faith. So when we talk of the Islamic Reformation, please understand that we're not making a value judgment, that there was something wrong with Islam and now it's gonna be better. There is no value in a reformation, it just is. It's not positive or negative. It's an inevitable process whereby uh, religious authority begins to uh, disseminate from the traditional institutions which hold on to it to individuals on the ground. Now, in the case of Islam, there isn't a pope, a singular authority. Um, authority instead rests in, in the hands of uh, about half a dozen um, schools of law, um, institutional schools of law that um, because of their how long they've been around and because of the consensus that has formed around them uh, have essentially become you know the equivalent of let's say six popes that's the best way to to, to put it um, <laughs> or six papacies that's a that's a better way of putting it uh, six vaticans um, but nevertheless the same thing applies these institutions these individuals, the ulama, the learned ones, were the only ones who had access to the scripture, the only ones who could read the scripture. Um, and so as a result, they're the only ones who could interpret what the scripture meant. And so for most, most Muslims, for the last 1400 years, they really had no uh, uh, other al alternative except to go to their alam, their, their learned one, and to uh, uh, receive the knowledge secondhand from them. In the last 50 years, the Quran has been translated into more languages than in the previous 1500 years combined. Um, rapid, rapid advances in uh, education in large parts of the Muslim world, in literacy in large parts of the Muslim world have given individuals access to the scripture in a way that would have been unheard of in the previous century, um, in the previous centuries. And as a result, what's happened is what always happens in these cases. Individuals have begun to set themselves up as their own authority structures, and they've begun to push back against the traditional authorities. I also wanna say very quickly that this is not necessarily a smooth process, okay? Uh, the Christian Reformation resulted in the death of half the population of Germany alone. Uh, and by the way, this notion of sola scriptura, this idea that the scripture alone should be the source of authority and anyone should be able to go to it and interpret for themselves what the scripture means, as you already know, opens up a whole can of worms. <laughs> because that means now anyone, anyone is their own source of authority. And if that person has you know, a, an outlet or an audience, um, a, a, a way of, of making their voice heard, then they can essentially start their own movements. I mean, Christianity fractured into hundreds of sects and schisms as a result of the Christian Reformation. And the same thing is happening within Islam now. You have a multiplicity of voices, a multiplicity of authorities, no longer six, now 6,000. And each one of them says, this is the correct interpretation. And so the conflicts that we are seeing in large parts of the Muslim world are a direct result of the Reformation. They're not proof that Islam needs a Reformation. They are the Reformation. That's what you are witnessing is the Reformation. It's a chaotic, catastrophic, bloody event. Interesting. So right now, and oh yeah, you go, sorry, go ahead, please. Say no, one continue thing, on. I just keep going. Yes. And by the way, it's very difficult to know who the, the villains and heroes uh, will be of this story. 
We lionize Martin Luther. Martin Luther was a genocidal maniac. Um, Martin Luther didn't say that anyone should be able to read the scriptures and interpret it for themselves. He said he should be able to read the scriptures and interpret for themselves. When Thomas Munster, his fellow Reformation uh, uh, leader, said that's a great idea and began what will eventually became known as um, the, uh, um, uh, well, it's sometimes referred to as the Radical Reformation or whatever. Um, uh, Martin Luther's response was Munster and all of his followers should be killed and their houses should be burned to the ground. So, you know, so I've, I've argued in the past that 500 years from now, we may look back and think of Osama bin Laden as one of the titans of the Islamic Reformation. Because this is a man who, whose entire message was predicated on stop going to mosque, stop talking to your imam, stop listening to the learned men. They have nothing to teach you. All you need is the Quran and nothing more. And you can read that and it'll tell you what to do. Now, I'm the one telling you what to do. I'm telling you what it says. But his argument was an argument of sola scriptura that sounded very, very much like the argument that Martin Luther was making 500 years ago. Wow. Well, yeah, so, there you yeah. go. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, one of the th we're right now, Christianity is in the middle of a reformation uh, at this point in time, and we're reacting to predominantly modernity and science, which has slowly kind of eroded away at many of the principles that Christians have held dear for a long time. I preach about that in this church a lot, trying to say, you know, this, is, this tidal wave has been coming for a long time, and now we are trying to work our way through um, what it's going to look like. And it, it's, it, you know, you can literally see in some congregations, it's just eroding away, you know, every year. There's just less and less people, because the younger generation, they have grown up with a skeptical, scientific yep. perspective. And um, I wonder, is that something that is, that is also impacting, I would assume it is, but how is it impacting uh, Islam as far as you can see? I mean, the, the youth bulge in uh, traditionally Muslim majority countries is unfathomable. I mean, if you look at what we now refer to as the modern Middle East, which is North Africa, um, Middle East, and then parts of Central Asia, and of course, um, South, South Asia, um, Manasseh, it's sometimes referred to, Middle East, North Africa, South Asia, Manasseh. In Manasseh, 75% of the population is under 35. 50% is under 25. Wow. Um, it's, a, it's a youth bulge that, uh, when combined with all these other things that I was talking about, this is a, a, a youth bulge that is educated, is literate, is globalized, it's plugged in, you know, they, they, they're on the internet, they're in social media, they know what's happening around the world, they have access to new and novel theories, sources of information. Um, they, they just simply do not accept the kind of traditional Islamic authorities any longer. Um, and they certainly don't do so as their sort of sole source of information or interpretation. Um, you know, they're much more likely, they're much less like, look, look, 30 years ago, if you were a Muslim living in Malaysia and you had a question about some aspect of Islam in your life, you know, some, you had a question about marriage or about whatever the case may be, your only option was to go to the mosque, uh, talk to your imam, tell him your problem, and then he, because he's the only one who has access, uh, would tell you uh, the answer. This is, this is what you're, you should do, and then you go off and, and do it. Today, that Malaysian has at least five or six different uh, online fatwa databases that he could just simply go to. He could just simply you know, search in these databases his question, 
and get the views of 40 different imams from all over the world. And then because this is how Islam works, that no, no cleric has authority to, um, uh, no, no cleric has authority over another cleric, right? So it's like, it's like rabbinical Judaism. Right, one rabbi is, has as much authority as another rabbi. It's not like they don't, one kind of over, overcomes the other one. There's no hierarchy. Um, this, this kid can just simply pick which, which idea he likes the best. That's the one, I like that answer, much more than these other 29 answers. That's just now we're sort of understanding the consequences of that. That's going to absolutely alter the face of Islam in the, the coming century. I think with Christianity, what we're seeing is yes, two things. Number one, um, the what happens, you know, every generation in which um, Christian doctrine has to figure out a way to uh, uh, make peace with our rapidly changing understanding of the universe and and reality. To me, there's a much more interesting phenomenon taking place in American Christianity, particularly in Protestant evangelical Christianity, and that is um, the politicization of it. Um, the shorthand for this, of course, is what's been happening with the Trump, Trump evangelicals. Um, and there have been numerous really fantastic uh, uh, papers and articles and books that have been written about this. I've talked about this ad nauseum, um, about the way that Trump, uh, you know, he broke evangelical Christianity. He breaks everything he touches, but, um, you know, but he's really, you know, he broke, he broke American evangelicalism because he's created this crisis within the single largest um, body of Christians in the United States. Um, over whether, you know, the, the, the sort of this kind of unblinkered support of a, how can I put this, a racist, sexist, lecherous, pathologically lying, narcissistic sociopath. Um, uh, Tell us how you really feel. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, try, I'm trying to think, that was like the most polite way that I could put it. I was like, how can I, how can I put it politely? That's about as politely as I could put it. Whether this, this unblinkered support for him from his evangelical base is a betrayal of what evangelical Christianity was supposed to mean. Um, that to me is the real fascinating uh, evolution of American Christianity that, that I think hmm. is, is going to have some very interesting consequences in the next decade or so. So yeah, so bringing it up, looking into the future, um, when we're talking about, I guess, religion and particularly Islam, you know, what are your hopes 30, 50 years down the line when we're talking about the various adherents to the, to the different traditions of Islam? What do you right. hope for them? And then I'm also interested in, in what your hopes are for Islam as a geopolitical force in the world, which mm -hmm. it is. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a huge force. Um, that's, that's super interesting. Um, well, look, as I said earlier, I mean, all religions are constantly in a state of evolution. Islam 30, 50 years from now will not look like Islam today. Globally, one, one thing that's really fascinating is what we're seeing is um, that Christianity, global Christianity, is in the process of moving eastward and southward uh, in the world, whereas global Islam is in the process of moving northward and westward. And it'll it'll be you know, a good century before these sort of religions really rebalance uh, the globe as far as population centers go. Um, and that's an idea that, that people are already starting to, to chew on now to figure out what that's going to mean 100 years from now when we stop referring to, you know, when, when we can say that Christianity is an Eastern religion. Like that's a weird thing to say, that the, the majority of Christians are gonna be in Asia, wow. you know, that's, that's a strange phenomenon to think about, right? Because that's not how we think about it. And the majority of Muslims will be in sort of Europe and in, in the West. Um, so that to me, I think, is going to be really fascinating. And what that, how that's going to affect Islam 
is I think it's going to accelerate this reformation process. Like the truth of the matter is that Islam is fundamentally a communal religion. That's, it arose out of a communal society. It's all about community. Your salvation rests in the ummah, in the community itself. It's the source of salvation. And yet it's undergoing this radical individual, individual, individualization. That's the word I'm looking for. It's undergoing this rapid individualization um, for all the, the reasons that we had talked about before. And I think that the more it moves westward and northward, the more the geography of Islam changes, the more individualistic it's going to become. The more we're going to see um, greater sectarianism in Islam, greater, uh, is that me? It's not just me, right? Is that <laughs> me? No? Okay. Uh, greater sectarianism, greater schisms, um, greater micro communities. And then I'll just add one more, one more factor to this because I think it's fascinating not just for Islam but for, for religion in general is that um, you know, the, the, the internet and social media has transformed the definition of community. We have to understand that from the dawn of humanity to about 30 years ago, the definition of community was the people around you. That's what it meant. It was a geographic thing, whether that meant the people in your cave, or the people in your village, or the people in your city, or the people in your nation. Community is geographically defined and always has been. Now, religion has always been a transnational force. It's always tried to break through borders and boundaries. But nevertheless, even so, I mean, I'm sure that, that you guys have an enormous connection to the larger Presbyterian community in the United States, but nevertheless, there's still the sort of the microness of it, right? Like this is our community here. What the internet has done is completely change what community means. It's no longer geographically bound. Um, and so, you know, if you are that Malaysian kid, that Malay Muslim Malaysian kid, um, you may have more in common with you know, a, a, a Muslim in, kid in Chicago because you both like Game of Thrones and you both you know, uh, you know, like the same kind of music than either of you have with your community. And so they're building blocks of creating these new communities, these virtual communities is already there, it's already happening. So that's just going to continue to accelerate the fracturing of the Muslim world into these more and more smaller, more rarefied schisms and sects, um, just in many ways the way that Christianity did after the, the Christian Reformation.